I mean, for real. Because you're like the coolest person I've ever met. And, and you don't even have to try, you know? I try really hard, actually. Our first movie is Juno, and it might not Maybe be the best movie of 2007, but it's certainly one of my favorites, and one that's sure to endure as a smart comedy classic in the vein of Little Miss Sunshine, Sideways, and Napoleon Dynamite. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm A.O. Scott from the New York Times. Hello, Tony. Hello, Richard. Juno opens next week. This is an early review. Ellen Page deserves the Oscar buzz she's generating in the title role. Juno's a preternaturally wise 16-year-old oddball charmer who has a one-time hookup and gets pregnant. The always entertaining character actor J.K. Simmons is Juno's dad, and Alice and Janney, I just love her. She's brilliant as Juno's stepmom. Now, much has been made of the screenplay by first-time sensation Diablo Cody. It's sure to get an Oscar nomination. Now, true, some of the hipster dialogue celebrates cutting-edge cleverness, maybe at the expense of authentic exchanges. But you know what? I'll take a little self-indulgence when the screenplay and the direction from Jason Reitman is so consistently funny and warm and touching and spirited. There is such a powerfully endearing spirit to Juno that I embrace this film from the opening credits right to the end. Small flaws be damned, I gotta say it, I loved, loved this movie. I loved it too, although it's interesting that you say credit to credit, because the first time I saw it, for about the first 20 minutes, I was really annoyed with it. Ooh. I thought it was overly clever. I thought it was going to be trying to be one of these edgy, sundancey, suburban, dysfunctional comedies about teenage sexuality. Yeah. And then it completely won me over. Ooh. Partly because Ellen Page, who is what, yeah, you know, 4'11", kind of um, 20 years old, is yeah. such an amazing actress. She can so look, good. So in good. the same scene, she can look, you know, 10 years younger than she is and then 10 years older. And she nails this character exactly she does. right. She does, Tony. She has this way of, even when she's delivering some of the these lines, which, yeah, occasionally are, you know, awfully glib, uh, but you can see in her eyes that there's a lot of other things going on, that yeah. she's a scared kid and she's naive, and obviously she's made some big mistakes. Well, exactly. You know? She's smart, mm -hmm. but she's not as smart as she thinks she is, and part of what the movie is about is how she doesn't understand mm -hmm. everything that she thinks she does about the grown-up world, and especially about this couple. The Jason Bateman, Jennifer Garner thing, the way that those characters yes. change, exactly. and the way that we look at them, and the way that Juno perceives them, is one of the most brilliant and surprising kind of dramatic and, and, shifts. You know, so I, I mentioned so many of the other actors, and they're both excellent here. And, and you're right, because when you first see Jennifer Garner and the way she's dressed and the way she's comporting herself, you're like, oh, I know that type of individual. Same thing with Jason I mean, Bateman. And then as it develops in, in such a, a, an authentic way, in a natural way, that it takes us by surprise. And, and all of the characters feel so real and so well yeah. observed. It's just, it's a, it's a wonderful you just, movie. You know, you just want to stay in the world with these characters. They're very real yeah. to you. And, and I think you could almost say the same thing about our next movie, which all is right. starting out in the evening. And it has... I think one of my favorite performances of this year yes. um, and it's just a movie that I like a lot now the writing life is something that movies often get wrong partly because there's nothing very cinematic about someone staring at a blank page or tapping words onto a screen but when Frank Langella in a crisp white shirt and a tightly knotted necktie sits down at his typewriter you feel all the struggle and excitement of genuine literary creation Langella plays Leonard Schiller a Manhattan novelist in the twilight of his career I could lend you some books by the great critics of my era appreciate that. I doubt that they're taught in academies anymore, but that's really all to their credit because they weren't theorists, they were readers. I would like to continue with criticism. It'd be a good excuse to read the books I love over and over again. That's Lauren Ambrose as Heather Wolf, an ambitious young graduate student who's writing a master's thesis on Leonard. Though it's clear from the start that her interest in him is much more than merely academic. Life betrayed you. And you went into hiding, and you took your characters with you. So they began guarding their lives. They stopped giving in to temptation. No, Miss Wolf. They learned the cost of living only for themselves. And I became aware of problems far greater than my own. Lily Taylor as Leonard's daughter Ariel and Adrian Lester as her on-again, off-again boyfriend are also excellent in this film. So is Lauren Ambrose, who demonstrates her maturity as an actress by allowing her character's immaturity to show through her seductiveness and intellectual poise. It doesn't slight any of them to single out Frank Langella, though, who with perfect understatement embodies not only an elderly writer, but the whole grand, fading edifice of New York literary culture in his every sigh and gesture. 
What a great performance. I, I embrace it on the same level that you do, Tony. Yeah. I think Frank Langella is definitely nomination worthy work. Right, and say. really, again, you're right, a very different film, but just captures a world that just rings true in every single scene and it, just glorious. It doesn't glorious. overdo anything. No, I think in, in both of these it movies, it, these characters are such it individuals. It's just really they're high. interesting enough as they are. And here's a film that was shot for like 18 days on high def, <laughs> and yes. it's so rich and so textured and, and yes. such, you know, wonderful material. And this is a film with, with so many big movies coming out right now that I hope people look for because it's as good as Absolutely. anything that's out there. Absolutely right. Okay, later in the show, I'll tell you the only place you can see my review of the latest Jessica Alba film. And next, two of my favorite actors, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Laura Linney, are The Savages. Maybe Dad didn't abandon us. Maybe he just forgot who we were. She said, I got a lot riding on this book. And, and your life's much more portable than mine. What, what is that supposed to mean? What, like, like a toilet? What, like a porta potty? If someone titled a movie, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Laura Linney are the leads, I'd be there, no questions asked. They are two of the finest in their profession, and they shine with equal force in The Savages. This, again, is one of those small, perfectly crafted, bittersweet family dramas. It touches on so many truths, it's almost painful to watch at times. Hoffman plays John, Linnea is his sister, Wendy. You're an idiot. They're not particularly close in adulthood, but now they have to care for their ailing father, so they have to bond. We haven't seen you in a long time, and we're here to help you. So do something! You're the doctor? I'm gonna go get some money. He's not that kind of doctor, Dad. He, he's a professor. That is the excellent Philip Bosco. He plays the formerly intimidating Lenny, who is now at the mercy of the healthcare system and his bickering children. You know, you're just like him. He never thought I could do anything on it. Why are you comparing me to Dad? Comparing you to Dad? What is the point? No! You don't think I have any talent. You just don't think I can do anything. You obviously don't think you can do anything either because you have to lie about it. The Savages is from writer-director Tamara Jenkins many years after her sparkling debut with The Slums of Beverly Hills. This film reminded me of some of the classic character study films of the early 70s. If it had been made then, it would have been hailed as a minor classic. They'd still be showing it in film and acting classes, Tony. Absolutely. Philip Seymour Hoffman, mm. just to dwell on him for a minute, is so good at playing these like really the unpleasant characters Gosh. and yeah. without ever winking or playing for our sympathy, oh, no, no, you really no, no, yeah. care about this guy yeah. and you come to like him at the end. I don't know if I ever come to like him. I, I come to <laughs> empathize with him and understand him, but that's I think that's the brilliance well, I've, of his I've, performance. Well, I've known so many bitter second-rate academics in my life. Well, I almost <laughs> was one myself. You, you, so you know, this, this guy you know, just really pinpointed it. I mean, me. this film is so good at capturing that sort of mid-level academic who, you know, both of them struggling but still thinking they're far better than the people who are passing yes, them by yeah, in the yeah. fast lane. And then, yeah, there is some tenderness there because they really do find some love and they try to take care of their father as best they can. But there's no sentimentality. I mean, this is a no. movie that is very, no. very moving and also very, very funny, but there's no moment in it that's exaggerated, no. that's playing for a laugh. It's too good to tug at the heart. Too it's, it's, it's too good and, and too smart. Absolutely. Later in the show, I'll tell you why Hitman should have remained a video game. <laughs> and next, I'll tell you why we're not reviewing Awake on this oh, show and how to get my review anyway. It's my imagination, that's all. Oh my God. Something in the mist! Shut the door! Looking at movies now in theaters, I like the creepiness of the mist and the weird trippiness of I'm Not There. And speaking of movies now in theaters, Jessica Alba and Hayden Christensen are in a new film called Awake, and here's a quick look. It is a very real possibility that you will die right here on this table. You get your house in order just in case. As soon as you get out, I'll be right here. Now, the studio would not show us awake in time to review it on the show, but if you go to atthemoviestv.com right after this show is over, you can get my exclusive review. I'll be sure to check it out. Thank you, sir. Our next movie is Hitman, which was released into theaters just before Thanksgiving and did some pretty good box office over the holiday weekend. A big hit, apparently, with 23-year-old guys whose mothers let them out of the basement oh. for a few hours. Oh! By now, I imagine most of them have forgotten the experience entirely. Maybe a clip will refresh my memory. It seems like only yesterday that I was there. <laughs> Your location has been compromised. It's all coming back to me now. A lot of guys 
got their heads blown off. And Timothy Oliphant, with his head shaved, looking way too sensitive for the title role, plays a fellow who has been raised by an order of monks, you know, the ones that tattoo barcodes on the heads of their novices and turn them into vicious killing machines? Oliphant's character is known only as 47, and he tries to figure out who set him up in a botched plot to kill the Russian president. But he finds himself dogged by a grouchy Interpol detective played by Doug Ray Scott. He also rescues Nika, the slain president's sex slave. How will I find you? Don't worry. I'll find you. What are you going to do? What I do. But don't get the wrong idea. There's no hanky-panky between Nika, who's played by Olga Kurilenko, and the sexless 47. In fact, when she tries to jump his bones, he responds by knocking her out with a tranquilizer dart, which only makes her love him more. Of course, she does have the movie's best line. I've never felt such indifference in my whole life, she says. My feelings exact. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing with this guy, 47. First of all, <laughs> if, you, if you're going to be a, a renowned uh, international globe-trotting assassin, the barcode on the back of the bald head <laughs> would be one thing that might raise some eyebrows. And you station. might want to call yourself Jimmy or something at some point, because again, you know, your passport, 47. <laughs> as far as it being a video game, I was in, in, in the theater, and I was trying to rework work the remote control to close the curtains <laughs> and turn the sound down. So let's move on to something that is vastly yes, superior in a, in a different league completely. Okay. Next is a movie that nearly suffocates you, in fact, with its brilliance. The Diving Bell and the Butterfly is an intense, maddening, claustrophobic, and awesomely inspiring film. It's based on the true story of a man who wrote an amazing memoir, one letter at a time, by blinking his eye. Matthew Amalric is nothing short of great as Bobby, a hedonistic magazine editor who loves the many flavors of life. In his prime, he's felled by a stroke that leaves him almost completely paralyzed. Director Julian Schnabel infuses the diving bell and the butterfly with some of his own trademark artistic flourishes, as when Bobby's memories and imagination kind of merge as one. We see the tender relationship with his elderly father as well, played beautifully by Max von Sido. Mostly, though, we're in Bobby's mind as he attempts to rise above a fate that's beyond cruel. Filled with striking images, a touching soundtrack, and uniformly excellent performances, this is one of the more memorable movies of the year. This is an extraordinary piece of work. I mean, if you just think about what Schnabel did with mm. telling the story. I mean, the book is, is a very slender book. It has no particular plot. It's sort of lyrical observations and meditations on what it's like to be in this yeah. situation. And without imposing a conventional narrative structure on it, he's really brought out and developed this character and all of the other characters. It's mm. just, it's amazing. And it starts out very scary. It starts out, you're really looking out of this guy's one eye at the world and he yeah. doesn't know what yeah, happened to him. Yeah. And gradually opens up and shows you how his spirit and his mind developed. Schnabel does a very good job of not turning this guy into a saint. He yes, does become, yes. obviously, you know, a more thoughtful uh, person because he's, you know, trapped inside his own body, but he still is capable <laughs> of some real cruelty to, you know, one yes. woman who loves him and sees that he yes. still wants to be with his mistress and, and some other things that happen. Well, he's, so still, he's still a human being. Yes, and, and still a Frenchman, you know, a, a, a centralist, and <laughs> yes. he's surrounded by all these, these beautiful these gorgeous women. Yeah. women. You yeah. know, there's a the great scene where the, the speech therapist is, is showing him, you know, blowing kisses at him and yeah, moving her yeah. tongue around, and he's lying there in his coma thinking, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, beautifully done. Though. Brian De Palma's Redacted is the latest movie to try to make some sense out of the situation in Iraq. And it uses documentary techniques to tell a story based on an actual incident. The story is ugly. A group of American soldiers rape a teenage Iraqi girl and kill her family. And while parts of this film are certainly raw and upsetting, it's mainly an angry, uneven mess. What do you all think is going to be the first casualty of this entire conflict, huh? You. Thanks, <laughs> life. It's not going to be Rush it, or Flake or, or Don't Ask, it. Don't Tell over here. You know what it's going to be? Do you know what it's going to be? Do you know what it's going to be? It's going to be the truth. A lot of the cast are making their film debuts in Redacted. And while they give it their best, neither De Palma's script nor his direction serve them very well. I give him credit for trying something very serious here and for risking attacks from the usual ideological blowhards. But this movie ultimately tells us more about one filmmaker's indignation at the war in Iraq than it does give us any insight about the war itself. You're so right, Tony. I didn't have much use for this film 
film at all. Noble intentions notwithstanding. Yeah, sure. I mean, the gimmick, you know, you give them points for that. We've seen that a million times before. <laughs> here's a guy shooting a video, and here's right, a documentary, right. and here's the cell phone and stuff. The acting's horrible, and at one point, they all have to, like, stay in front of the security camera for this extended <laughs> and have sequence. have a big argument. Just, and yeah. have this horrible argument, which, which yes. you know, all this overacting. Yes. And, you know, these guys are all such monsters and creeps right off the bat. You know, it, it, yeah, it's based on a horrible incident, but it, it serves no purpose to show us this version of what may have happened. Well, because it doesn't give think. us any insight. It doesn't no, really none. let us, no. you know, who are these guys? What's going on there? It, it seems to it's me very sending to the audience, and, and too, it's I glib. We're getting finally. hit over the head yes, with this yes, so much. Yes. All right, coming up next, it's super bad on DVD, and we'll show you the six percent <laughs> or so of the extras that are suitable for television. <laughs> You, man. You. But first, here's a look at what's coming up on next week's show. She is in possession of the golden compass. She must be found. I'm leaving you. You can take the children, but you leave me, my monkey. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Roper. Join me Thursday, December 6th, for a live online chat about the holiday season's best and worst at the movies. Just go to atthemoviestv.com. We're going to talk about everything cinema this holiday season. We'll review what's coming to theaters. We'll talk about some of the classics. And we'll also discuss those new DVD releases you want under the tree. Just go to atthemoviestv.com Thursday, December 6th. I'll see you there. <laughs> oh. Why is Daddy tickling that lady? I, I'm sorry. Um, All right, looking at movies new on DVD, I thought The Nanny Diaries was a real missed opportunity. I really didn't like Arctic Tale. However, I really enjoyed Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Finally, something we disagree about. Yeah. I really just, it did, I was so tired of it uh, by, by the I, You know, my affection for the, for the series grew, actually. I didn't like the first one so much, but I liked the third one the best. Huh. What about Superbad? Did you like Superbad? I, it's the story of my life. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how they knew that stuff, but uh, you know, it was all you right there. You actually could play McLovin in a 30 well, years later. I'm glad you later, said that or, guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, or, but, but you know what, I, I love the film. I mean, yes. it's very raunchy, very real, but to me it's like one of those great classic teen comedies. It reminded me in its, in its spirit and its humor of Fast Times at Ridgemont High 25 years ago, and now it's out with uh, the DVD, and they did a great job with the extras. Really? No, I mean, Let's take a look at one of them right here. So, the thing about Sarah's. I didn't see any of this coming at the audition. You just, I, you know, I thought, oh, he's a sweet kid, he's 17, he's turning 18, but Jesus, I've been around a long time. This is the most irritating guy I've ever worked with, and I've, I've worked with them all. You know, I'm not always a huge fan of all these That's extras so on DVDs, but with both Knocked Up and Super Bad, they, they put a lot of time and effort into it, and it's really worth your time. It's really funny stuff. Well, and you can see how they made these movies by just throwing all of this stuff in the mix and, and, and <laughs> sad that they had to give some up for the theatrical release. Yes. My video pick this week is the fourth season of The Wire, the HBO series created by ex-journalist and TV Ooh, genius David Simon. I know this is not a movie, but in terms of quality Almost of acting and writing and the depths of its of insight, The Wire out shines most of the movies out there. It's a social panorama worthy of a great novel. Bleakly funny, heartbreaking, and completely addictive. All right, The Wire season four and Superbad will be in stores on Tuesday. We'll be back to recap this week's show right after this. Closed captioning for Ebert and Roper is sponsored by... Man has evolved to the point where he no longer needs to stand in line for tickets. The movie tickets card available only at movietickets.com. Guests of Ebert and Roper stay at the Peninsula Chicago, the city's most exciting luxury hotel, located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile. All right, recapping the movies on this week's show, we both loved, loved Juno. It opens in limited release next week. We also like starting out in the evening, The Savages and The Diving Bell and The Butterfly, but... Stay away from Hitman and stay away from Redacted. Well, there's some very good movies out there to see. And some crapola to avoid. All right, that's it for this week. Until next week, the balcony is closed. I did it. I surrendered to my desire. It's Pancake Surrender at IHOP. Try pumpkin, cheesecake, or carrot cake. IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. My Bliss? New Blistex Soothing Splash Lip Infusion. Cool Rollerball? Soothing Liquid Formula. Discover Bliss. Discover Blistex. If you have high blood pressure like me, you need powerful cold medicine with a heart. Coruscant HBP. It won't raise your blood pressure. Coruscant HBP.